Toppy, Ratter is my maiden name. I got married. But I was her side cap and I also worked for the Frenchman Wood River Weed Management Area. So I'm going, I've been working for her side cap for a few years now. And most of the projects I've been working on are habitat management agreements. And they all revolve around Leaky Spurge and kind of managing Leaky Spurge and getting control of Leaky Spurge on Native Prairie. So um, maybe Lee and I will do this presentation. He's, he's going to talk after. And he'll talk more about the goats and the targeted grazing end of things. But I wanted to give you a little story about Lee so you can kind of get to know what kind of guy he is. So he was driving through some fern a couple of weeks ago. And he was picking up minerals or something. And a policeman pulled him over. He had a goat in the shotgun seat of his truck. And the police officer told him, you need to take that goat to the zoo. Well, a couple weeks later, Lee was in Swift Current again, picking up something he forgot. And the same police officer pulled him over because him and that goat were in the truck again, but they were both wearing sunglasses. <laughs> the officer said to him, I thought I told you to take that goat to the zoo. And Lee's response was, well, I did, and we had so much fun, we're going to the lake this weekend. <laughs> I'll talk to you about the ranch where we have this goat project um, and the problem that wasn't. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the project itself, uh, the type of monitoring that we started to do, and then a few comments from the ranchers. Okay, so before we get too far into this, we need to go back to elementary school where we learned what habitat was, or is, sorry. So according to Webster, it is a place or environment where a plant or animal naturally or normally lives. Britannica says it's a place where an organism or a community of organisms lives, including all living and non-living factors or conditions of the surrounding environment. Basically, it is a place for um, something like grassland birds to have food, shelter, and a place for them to nest in and raise their young. So, good habitat will provide a bird with lots of food, the food it needs for itself and for its young. It will provide shelter from predators, and it will provide an appropriate safe place for, for the bird to raise its young. So that middle picture, it's kind of hard to see, but there is actually a nest kind of in that little bunch of grass. So as you can see, that native prairie grass can really hide the nest and provide really good shelter for the birds. This last picture is a uh, species at risk. It's a long-billed curlew, and they blend in really good to the native prairie surrounding the nest. So it's important that that native um, prairie environment is intact for both species, for all grass members. So when invasive weeds start taking over the native prairie, there's a negative impact, of course. There's been a number of studies that have been done across around the world and uh, most of these, almost all of the studies conclude that native species have a negative impact on um, different species. <laughs> so what does this mean for our grassland birds? Well, the ones that require native prairie uh, for good habitat, it means that um, sometimes, sorry, I'm getting confused. Um, it found that birds nesting in exotic plants have higher predation rates, and mainly that's because the structure of the vegetation that they're nesting has changed, so it, it provides a better pathway for different predators to, to get to them. It also means that there's a decrease in um, a good food source, so the, the, plant, the plants producing the fruits and the seeds are they might not be palatable to the grassland birds, or they could be toxic. So it also goes beyond that, closer to the ground. Um, invasive plants can be unpalatable and even toxic to insects, which means the number of insects within an, an invasion of exotic weeds is drastically less abundant, and many of the grassland birds rely on those insects for themselves and also for their young. So other impacts 
yeah, so the poor food source means that um, nesting can start later if there's not enough food available for the birds. Um, it can also mean that the poten potential for reproduction or fecundity can be lowered and the number of young can also be lowered. So, invasive weeds don't just affect wildlife, of course. It can affect your crop. With invasive weed um, within cropland, it can decrease the quality and quantity of your, of your crop. So, in this picture, it's a little hard to tell, but that is a lentil field, and the herbicides have already been sprayed, and you can see the taller dead stuff is thistle and potion and whatever else. And the brown shorter stuff is lentils, and that nice tall beautiful green stuff is all like the spurge, and it's doing just fine. For some livestock, it can also be a problem. Cattle won't readily eat leaky spurge, so this could mean with a large invasion, a decrease in the amount of forage available for your cows and calves. It could mean that um, you might have to um, provide different uh, food for your calves to reach the goal weights that you have in your program or whatever else. Um, or it could mean that you sell your calves at a lower weight. That's if it's a huge, huge, huge invasion. So of course it will affect our bank accounts from less money from poor crops or um, poor livestock. Uh, it could increase your inputs into your livestock or controlling invasives in your crops. And it's, if the invasion gets big enough, it becomes very costly to get control and management of that invasive weed um, invasion. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, the story of the ranch, how someone's little problem became someone else's big problem, and then someone else's opportunity. So, the history of the ranch. So, the arrival of leafy spurge to the area was in the 30s, when hay was imported from the east during drought. At least that's what some people say. Other people say it came in before that as a beautiful garden ornamental. And either way, it's been here for a long time. <coughs> of course, like most bad things, we don't understand the consequences until it's usually too late. So I'm sure that when Leafy Spurge reared its beautiful yellow head, no one really understood how bad it could actually be. And they left it alone. After a number of years, all of a sudden it was realized that Leafy Spurge was a beautiful devil plant and it was taking over. The land changed hands and the issues for the new land landowners was that the water flows through their ranch and it provides a source of water in, in other areas. And once you read the label on a chemical jug, you pretty much are convinced that the measly little plant is a is the lesser of two evils, the, one, the other, of course, being all the consequences and all the warnings on the chemical jug. So time continued to pass and leafy spurge continued to spread, and efforts were made to control the plant um, and manage the invasion. Uh, the ranchers at one time even bought a small sheep herd, but it was just too much. So I'll just go back to why Sidecap is interested in this, in this uh, branch. Um, our vision is that through collaboration we enable species at risk to thrive on working landscapes. So some of the species at risk um, habitat available on this ranch are for a bunch of these species. You have common nighthawk, barred squirrel, sprites, pipettes, uh, liver frog, butterflies, and loggerhead shrike. But there's a lot of other wildlife on that ranch too. They have moose, fox, coyotes, badgers, all kinds of different uh, grassland birds and other um, woodland birds like this mountain bluebird. So when I started in 2017, I was new to the whole thing. So Krista and I went and visited the landowners together. And we sat down with the producer to see how SOCAP could help them and how that in turn would help species at risk. There was a number of challenges to deal with as the plan of the project came together. The ranch is located near the Cypress Hills, so that means that the ranch has a lot of hills, there's a lot of trees there, 
And a lot of the area is very hard to access by foot or quad, tractor, truck, or whatever. And that becomes part of the problem in controlling the spurge. The other thing was the amount, there's quite a bit of water that runs through the ranch. So there's springs, there's little creeks, there's um, the beavers have been in there and dammed up water and made little ponds. Um, so there's a lot of areas that are not safe for chemical in the first place, but even if chemical was okay, it's hard to access those areas. The other thing was the soil. A lot of these areas are very gravelly and sandy, so the use of chemical um, doesn't doesn't work for that either. And then we got to the size of the invasion. As you can see, there's um, a lot of very large patches of leaky spurge. All the yellow that's on there is leaky spurge. And, and these are just a few pictures. There's a lot of area on the ranch that, that was covered. And, and so even if you know you, they, chemical was OK to be used, it was just the area was so big that it wouldn't have made economic sense to spray the chemical. <coughs> so, uh, the challenges led to realize there was no one good way to tackle a spurge, so we decided on an integrated approach using flea beetles, chemical, and targeted grazing using small remnants. So, um, flea beetles, we would release some near any of the little waterways each year. And in 2017 and 2018, we collected beetles near Moostra out of a public collection area. And then this year, we were able to collect beetles at a more local site. Um, it was on private land. And so since 2017, we've released over 25,000 beetles at six different sites throughout the ranch. Uh, collection of beetles takes place within the first few weeks of July, and that's when the beetles are um, eating above ground, eating spurge, or mating, and then they go below ground and, and lay their eggs. The larva hatches and eats the roots of the, the spurge and eventually it kills the spurge off. So um, it takes a lot of manpower to do this. The temperature has to be above 24 degrees Celsius. It can't be too cloudy, it can't be too windy, and if it is, they're still there, but they're, it takes a lot longer to collect them and they're closer to the ground. So we go out and we use sweep nets and we walk along and just sweep up the beetles, then we put them into a little sorter contraption that uh, Dustin Ostrander from uh, the Ministry of Agriculture kind of came up with, and it kind of sorts out some of the bigger insects that you don't want. They're still, at the end of the day, we still have a lot of ants, but, um, but it's mainly flea beetles. And then we measure them out, um, and then we put them into paper bags and into coolers, and the coolers have ice packs to kind of slow their metabolism and slow them down and prevent escape. And then we go up to our release sites and we just rip open the paper bag and let them go. So um, we also decided that chemical would still be used and we'd use that in areas that were um, easy to, easier to access, areas uh, close to the perimeter of the ranch to prevent the spread into the neighboring areas and along the, the roadway into the ranch because it's a high traffic area. And of course, it was decided to do target grazing using sheep or goats, uh, especially for those hard to reach places. So after a lot of time looking into this and into people who knew how to target graze, or even what it was, I eventually contacted Lee Sexton of Sexton Grazing and Consulting. He came and he saw and he forever changed my outlook on the yellow sea of grass, of spurge. And after spending some time with Lee, I started to realize that leaky spurge is a problem on many different levels, but it's also a really good opportunity for, for grazing small remnants and even business potential. So this year we, I started monitoring, and um, what I did is I picked 12 different monitoring uh, stations throughout the ranch in areas where target grazing will take place, where we're spraying chemicals, and where we release beetles. And the monitoring pro protocol was um, taken and adapted from Dr. John Bennett at the University of Saskatchewan. So what we do at these 12 stations is we run a tape measure 20 meters long, running north, south, east, and west. And then we use a 50 centimeter by 25 centimeter quadrat, and we measure um, the number of stems in that area, the amount of litter that's 
that's under the plants, the percent cover of the leafy spurge, um, if there's any bare ground, and also the height of the spurge. And hopefully over time that will show us that the grazing has, and the chemical and the beetles have been effective. And then next year, um, hopefully we'll go out and we'll see if there's um, beetles in the areas where we release them to see that whether or not their um, populations have come on. So we also use uh, some some photos. So here, this is these are two pictures from last year actually. The top picture, um, I don't know if you can see it as good back there, but it's there's a lot of yellow there. So I took a picture, um, that was before the goats were out there. I came back a week later and the bottom picture is a week later, so there's a little bit of yellow, but there's very little yellow there. So that to me is encouraging just because there's that much less seed production that's going on. So um, I sent the, the ranchers a couple of questions to kind of get their take on the project and how it's been for them. And so I'm going to share those answers with you. Um, I asked about any of their initial concerns, and like me, the, the amount of knowledge about target grazing, grazing was limited, and so we never, none of us really knew what to expect. Um, their initial concerns were about the goats uh, potentially getting out and roaming free, and also with goats you have dogs, you have herd dogs, and you have guard dogs, so there was some concern about those dogs interacting with the ranch dogs. And wonder, like, none of those concerns ever became a problem. Uh, another question I asked was if targeted grazing was anything like they expected and, some, and what were some of the differences. Um, of course, they didn't know what to expect. However, they did say that it had been better than what could they, sorry, it had been better than what could have, they could have hoped. It has been impressive how the goats and sheep can be trained to eat leafy spurge and that Lee manages the herds and the animals mostly eat leafy spurge. It's been interesting to see how Lee monitors the animals very closely to ensure the spurge is being eaten. Some days are frustrating when the animals aren't interested in the spurge and being a herdsman is a very busy job. Another benefit has been that the animals can graze the spurge on the hillsides and in the deep coulees where it's not easy to apply chemical. Finally, I asked if results were being seen and if the goats and sheep were having um, the effect that they thought. And the response was that you can see where the goats have grazed. There's a lot, yes, less yellow, but it's a little too early to, to really know the the impact. So the producers have felt very enthusiastic and hopeful about the project and are excited about where it goes. They appreciate Lee, he's excellent to work with and is passionate and knowledgeable about what he's doing and he's a great fellow to have around and is a hard worker. So just a couple other comments that they had made that I that were significant for me and that I wanted to share with you was um, like me, they came to realize that leafy spurge isn't just an issue, is, is not just a problem, it's also an opportunity. So here's a quote, the leafy spurge is providing food for another form of livestock, adding to the diversity of our ranch. We'll never be able to completely get away from chemical application, but we much prefer the goats to manage spurge than chemical for a variety of reasons, including environmental concerns and safe handling of chemical. And then their last remark, was I always remember Lee saying before we signed on with the project that we should look at Spurge as an opportunity. Those were powerful words to get involved in this project. So that was kind of a, a different insight for me as well when I first met Lee and we went to this place because you always hear of Lee Spurge being such an issue. But this project has been going very, very well. We're finishing up our second summer. Um, the project's going so well that the landowners actually bought a small herd of their own goats to keep the process going. Um, I asked if they had seen any um, impact on their, the grass available for their cattle and they haven't even noticed. The goats and the sheep are going after the spurge, um, a little bit of the shrubs to help digest and, and really that's, that's it. So um, I would say it's successful so far but it's still Pretty too soon to tell. Um, these are our sponsors, and 
I'll take questions after Lee is done talking. And that's it for me, if you want to come up. <laughs> Well, Mel done a good job. Any questions? <laughs> yeah, I, I got a joke. That's not as good as Mel. So. <laughs> Forget the name of the person that studies uh, the supernatural. But he was doing a class uh, with students and uh, asking them if, if, how many people in my class actually believe in ghosts. And there was a few put up there. How many have seen ghosts? Well, there was a few less put up their hands, right? Finally, he said, anyone, has anyone made love to a ghost? One guy up the top raised his hand. And in all his years, he had never seen anybody raise their hand. He said, sorry, sir, but tell me more about your encounter with the ghost. Oh, a thousand pardons. I thought you said goat. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Larry Stewart is uh, something I really enjoy uh, doing, talking about helping people. Main objective: help people. Okay? Uh, I I uh, I like land enhancement. That's my job, more so right now. I've uh, been in it for over 20 years helping other targeted grazers get started by providing animals for them, supporting them, and more recently um, teaching people and helping them develop more better skills for their land enhancement. Uh, there's many types of, of, of different types of land enhancement skills, but what I do is uh, just uh, with the horse back. This is going this one. Uh, no, no. So, two goals I had was uh, showing the landowners that it is possible to do something, uh, and the other one was to make them believers, okay? And that's pretty tough in today's uh, lifestyle in the ranching world. Uh, I call it cowboy hat syndrome down south, Beth Britt, and B. Hayes calls it belt buckle syndrome, where there's that miscommunication between small ruminants and cowboys. Okay? It's just not happening. But years ago, our lambs in southern Saskatchewan hosted uh, a lot of sheep. And uh, they were pretty well all gone over the south now, unfortunately. And I think that's part of our problem with some of these unwanted vegetation that we have. Anyway, hopefully I'm trying to do that successfully, whether or not we can have it sink. In the beginning, I was contacted first by a lady, I don't know her name or who she was, and we made arrangements to meet and talk in the fall uh, over the course of the winter. Uh, it never happened for some reason. Uh, uh, apparently she left, saw a cat, so then my next contact was met. And uh, she arranged the meet and greet with a couple of ranchers. Uh, one, uh, I guess, down in Shawnee area, I guess it was, uh, who didn't really want to meet but meet us. So uh, then I went to this the other ranch uh, in this area and uh, got to talk with one of the ranch ranchers there and uh, had a very positive uh, talk with that person. And uh, I guess. Through the course of the conversation, listening to, to her, we, we drove out and we looked at it, and uh, I seen all this darn yellow spurge on the hills, and I'm going, man, I love this country. This is great, and I'm excited. Like, I'm thinking, this is a great opportunity. I wish I had this place. It, it would be mine if I had it. I, I love it. And uh, she made a comment of, uh, we can hardly wait until fall when the yellow's gone off the ranch so we can enjoy it. And that kind of got me and still gets me at times, but uh, 
We worked through that, I think. Anyway, distance became a problem for me when Mel asked if I wanted to do it because I believe the truck driver charges me 472 kilometers from door to door to deliver my animals. And that's a long ways from home when you have something going on at home already. We had, we had a, a sheep, cattle, and goat enterprise at home. Of course, I brought the goats last year, both sheep and goats this year. Uh, I had a pretty good discussion with Mel and, and a better one with my partner in life uh, who was going to have to stay at home and look after things while I was gone. And uh, last year was, uh, I think the contract was 76 days. Huh? Yes. And I didn't have any help last year. Uh, this year I'm fortunate enough to have a, um, a team player with me that I can uh, teach and I'm really enjoying that. And, uh, maybe I can get away once in a while. Last year was pretty tough to get away. Real tough. When we were out horseback and not much fencing going on, I didn't have time to really fence ahead. So, anyway, done the contract, made the decision to come, and then the planning started for to get here, and we started. Okay, and uh, that's a goal that had kids. Last year, I on the project, I wanted the kids, I'm out there just, yeah, I had done it at Elbow when I managed the Elbow, Elbow project and uh, it was pretty successful. I wanted to climb down here to see what it was like and I think that there is huge potential to uh, lamb and kid out on that leafy spurge. It's high, high protein and the animal is really good on it. Um, and that's how sometimes I brought my kids in, was in the saddlebag, yes. <laughs> they get up there, and I'd catch them, put them in the saddlebag, and bring them home, and clean out all the little poop that was in there, and the runny gummies, you know. <laughs> they got on the lunch bag in there. <laughs> but anyway, come out, we had to train animals to eat first. All my animals are fresh. I come out of and I sold all the animals from Elbow when I managed Elbow. Any animals I had there, I sold. Uh, Elbow, if you're not familiar, is a PFRA pasture there that I managed. I had about 12,000 acres infected with spurge all on uh, that land. And we had up to, last year I was there, we had 3,200 sheep and goats. I managed to show them that. And uh, it's still going under private. Uh, they, I, I tried to get those patrons to invest with some of the funds that they receive with help from the federal government, uh, but they never invested in animals, which is unfortunate. I think they could have really done something with it. Anyway, I got into here last year and started training animals, and they weren't eating the way I wanted them to eat. So we fenced off a hillside and I put them pollockers in there and we, we got them eating some spurs. And then uh, I had to develop a plan. So my plan was to do on any other project to do the outside and shrink it. Um, on this place, uh, Mel said, we want you to do the runways and the coolies and stuff that we can't spray, which is normal for us targeted grazers. We always get the crappy stuff, right? We get the hard stuff. I can compete. <laughs> I can compete with the chemical company, but not in them places. It's like it costs more to do it. So I guess I have a plan, and that's been hitting the valley, and, and, and not everything coming off the valley. I've tried to work with the landowners. Um, very easy to work with, uh, quite understanding, and um, understand the principles of what we're trying to do. Soil health and species, man species management is something that I always strive for, and, and uh, the species management thing is, is a, like I say on their pasture layer, some people call it stacking enterprises is another term I've heard. I've always called it multi-species grazing for, you know, that's the simplest thing. But uh, the landowner came up with this one and, and I appreciate it a lot and he says, I get it. It's an enterprise within an enterprise and it truly can be an enterprise within an enterprise that can benefit and, and pay dividends. Um, we talk about usually one, uh, say, goat per cow, right, as a rule of thumb. Um, I have no problem dumping four per cow on this place, and you wouldn't see any impact on, on the other um, vegetation that cattle are eating. 
other things and, and hopefully things fall into place on their own. Because if it isn't their idea, then it's no idea that's going to be workable in my mind. Because I'm not there all the time. So we, we're, we're developing and enhancing more grazing techniques. And uh, I want to touch on that because I found that I can get my goats to eat more in, in less time. I'm stuffing them goats. <laughs> And their rumens are swelling, and I'm developing bigger rumens on the goats that we have. And they're coming out looking like they're pregnant with, with quads or some darn thing, but they're huge. <coughs> and uh, not having to, they'll only eat so much, right? They'll only eat so much, in so many hours of the day, and we're stuffing them in in a little quicker time. And going out, bringing them in, letting them digest things, and then going back out with them again. And they just, that evening, they just, gore something hard, and then the next morning they're having trouble because they're not wanting to go out there, right? Which is okay for me, I, I don't mind sleeping. <laughs> um, so we go out, you know, 8, 9 o'clock in the morning, and they'll go out there and they won't really want to eat hard. It might take us half three quarters of an hour to get them kind of settled before they'll even start eating fairly, fairly hard. But once they start eating, they eat. Education, my team player, Educating that team player so that that person can has the skills to go on and and um, do this on on their own. Um, fortunate enough to find somebody that likes to ride a horse, and uh, that for me the impact on the, on the land on horseback is huge. I'd rather do that. Uh, elbow we rode. Uh, uh, quads and fenced a lot because I could teach people to fence properly in a short amount of time and everybody could ride an iron quad, no one could ride horses so I could find people to work on the right? So in the